everybody, and welcome to another great episode of My EdTech Life. Thank you so much for joining us on this wonderful Monday evening, or it may be well into Tuesday, depending on wherever you are in the world. Thank you so much for making us part of your day. Thank you so much for joining us live as well. Or if you'll be catching this on the replay and listening into it right now, thank you so much, as always, for making My EdTech Life what it is today. We do what we do for you so we can go ahead and bring some amazing conversations into our education landscape. And of course, you know, our mission is to uh, connect educators and creators one show at a time. So we really appreciate all the likes, shares and follows. And today I am really excited to have an amazing guest today. We're definitely going to be talking a lot about creativity, but we're also going to find out where our guest today finds so much time to do so much because he does stay rather busy as an author, as an educator, um, you know, and of course the work that he does with Adobe for Education. So I would absolutely love to welcome to the show, Mr. Ben Forta today. How are you this evening? Um, I'm good. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, this is, uh, uh, it's been a long day, but honestly, this is the, uh, this is what I was most looking forward to. So this is a wonderful break. I love talking at tech. I love talking to fellow educators and, uh, thank you for having me truly. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for being here. And I definitely want to acknowledge Tanya Gonzalez, who is joining us on YouTube right now, who's saying hello here from South Texas as well. Tanya is an amazing educator, and I had the privilege and honor to work with her uh, doing one of the Adobe Creative um, Summits, and it was just amazing. So very thankful for you, Tanya. Thank you so much for joining us. So Ben, let's go ahead and dive in. As you know, Every guest that I bring on is somebody that I look up to and has done some or has done or is doing some amazing work in the education landscape. And like I often tell all my guests, I liken them to a superhero of sorts. And we all know that every superhero has an origin story. So, Ben, I would love to ask, uh, you know, what your origin story is. But before we get into that, you know, and you tell us a little bit more, I always like to ask first. Was education something that you always knew you wanted to go into, or was it something that came in a little later in life? That's an interesting question. Um, I think it's something I always did naturally. I was never that good a student. I was always a better teacher than I was a student. Um, even as a kid, I actually didn't do very well in school, but I did far better helping other people in school. Um, my parents are both teachers. I grew, so I grew up in a family of educators. My Daughter was a special needs educator for many years. Um, so I've always been around teachers. They're, they're my favorite people. And so um, I, I guess I have several interests, but education has always been at the heart of them. So whatever I was doing, um, finding ways to share and inspire others and encourage them to do has always been part of it, even as a kid. So I think it's just kind of, kind of. Um, um, I wouldn't say it's something I naturally did. It's something that I just gravitated towards because I enjoyed it. Excellent. So now as that passion that you have for education. And like you said, it's, it's something that you always did. And for a, a lot of us, you know, maybe we came into education a little bit later, but it was just something that we just kind of did and in, in sharing, you know, our love for whatever it is that we wanted to share and we wanted to teach our, our fellow classmates or colleagues in whatever area what, that we're in. But for yourself, you know, when you made that jump into education and getting into the classroom, can you tell us a little bit about that, what your first impressions were, you know, uh, just kind of gathering a little bit of, of that insight from your reactions, because I, I just want to know how that led you to what you're doing now. And that that's really a great story all in its own. Yeah, ab absolutely. So um, as you can probably tell from my accent, I'm not a native here. I do. I live in the Midwest. I live in Michigan, but I grew up in the UK and London. Um, my very first paid job of sorts was tutoring. You know, back as a kid, as a teen, you know, wanted to make a few, few dollars on the side. Um, I was tutoring kids, and that's it. So I was doing it for as long as I can remember, and then as a substitute teacher. And then, um, you know, my career went in a, several trajectories, but I was always teaching. Um, and so um, I, I actually formally in the classroom didn't come till many, many years later, um, other than the substitute teaching. But I've always, um, so I, I love learning things. I love discovering things. Um, and I love sharing what I learned. I wasn't that good a student, to be honest. Um, I was that kid who, in school, Every single year, year in, year out, my entire school career, 
parents would go for conferences and they would come back with the same line every time. It is, he has so much potential if only he applied himself. I can't tell you how many times I heard that. Um, and at the time, I got to tell you, as a kid, I, I thought it was me. I thought I was the only one on the planet who actually found school so utterly boring, um, who just wasn't inspired and, um, um, you know, ended up um, finding things that I like myself. You know, I think I, fortunately, I'm a bit older. I grew up at a time when there were less distractions. And nowadays, I probably would get in really, really big trouble. Back then, there wasn't much else to do if you weren't interested in studying. And so I parked myself in the library. Um, and so I was reading and, and, and taking notes and trying to do it myself and self-teaching. Uh, and I've always loved that. And then combining that, um, just like knowing things, uh, interest, curiosity, with the ability to uh, share it with others was kind of where I found a, a real passion, a real love. Um, and it was exciting. It, it was wonderful. And so that's what I started doing. And um, um, even you know, along the way, I you know, built a company, sold a company, had a variety of jobs. I was always doing teaching on the side. I was always you know, writing or going into a classroom or volunteering. Um, actual in the classroom came many, many years later, but it's always been a part of my life. Wow, that is wonderful to hear. And, you know, uh, Ben, uh, just speaking about education and even like myself and your story that you're saying, it's like oftentimes, you know, a lot of the people that I've had the opportunity and honor to meet that have been very creative and very successful, you know, it's interesting that many times they, you know, it made similar stories to you in the classroom and then everything just kind of just fell into place and you just, you know, be a, a very creative person, always thinking outside the box. And like you mentioned, you know, build up companies, sold up companies and, or sold companies and so on. And then, you know, what was it at what moment did you say, you know what, I want to I want to go into the classroom now and and just start that journey? Um, it was opportunistic. Um, I, I, it actually, uh, so and, uh, one of my side loves, other than, so uh, I've lost puppies, but one, one of the things I love doing is, um, I, I'm a coder at heart. I'm a techie, I'm a geek. And I've been coding since long before coding was actually cool. Right. Back when, back when the words geek and nerd were, were derogatory terms, now they're kind of badges of honor. Um, and, um, so I've always been doing that and, um, um, I've taught coding. I've, I've got a maker space in my basement. My kids use it as well. We've got everything from 3d printers to laser cutters, you name it, we're always tinkering and creating stuff. And, um, I love seeing kids come to life when they get a chance to, to create and build. And, um, I started just volunteering in schools and ended up building something of a curriculum and then finding a local school that let me do it and ended up teaching a high school coding and robotics class because I didn't like what was out there. And it felt too, too uh, rigid, too structured, not enough free play, not enough chance to make and break and blow things up and try again. Um, it was all pre-made kits versus really get your hands dirty and play. And so, um, um, I, I wanted to do it. And so I approached a couple of schools and some let me and while I had a full time job anyway, and finally got a chance to do that. But that was only the that was the most recent teaching, but I've been teaching all along. I've been doing, you know, teaching coding classes. I've taught um, um I probably taught a million people to code over the years, um, not just kids, but grown ups as well. Um, and it's, it's truly is what I love doing. Um, uh, giving, help people discover something that they love and are passionate about that they didn't know they would be passionate about is magic. Right. That, that's just there's there's, there's, a, there's a thrill. Um, and, you know, I'm very fortunate in my Adobe job is that I get to wear both those hats. Right. So I get to to teach and I get to help direct products that are good for educators while also coding, while doing marketing. It's, it's, a, it's this wonderful, happy amalgamation of everything I love. Um, and I'm very fortunate to be able to do it. Oh, that is amazing. Absolutely amazing. So, Ben, we do have a question here from Tanya. And her question is this you know, during your school years, did you, did a teacher inspire you to become an educator? Uh, if not, who was it that inspired you? But I, I mean, you've told us that. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I kind of wish I could say, yes, there was a particular teacher I could point to that I had an aha moment. But honestly, I think more important was um, finding that the teachers I had back then really weren't reaching me and having to do it myself. And I, I just feeling there was a better way. You know, I spent a a lot of time in classrooms nowadays. I, part of my Adobe role, I, I'm in classrooms all over the country, all over the world, actually. And I see teachers nowadays who are engaged and inspired and 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 motivating and and gen it's, it's education's changed a lot in the last few decades for the good. Um, I think it was my experience in not having educators that related to me that made me want to do things differently. And I've spent most of my life trying to um, educate and create education experiences that I wish I would have had. And didn't. So I think, Tanya, it's a great question. But I actually think, unfortunately, the answer is the reverse. It was the lack of those that made me want to do it. 
Wow. That is what an interesting story and what an interesting experience that you have. But I definitely want to bring to light what you said right now. That was very important, creating those learning experiences. You know, at that time, the teachers that you had weren't equipped with providing you those learning experiences that you needed. But the fact that you saw exactly what you needed and now having the ability to go into classrooms, I I would assume, because I know I do it, I get to go into classrooms, but sometimes I can see a little bit of myself in some of the students and see like, maybe this might work for them, uh, you know, or maybe this other way might work for them and being able to provide just that little additional layer for that experience to really come to life or really be a memorable moment for them that they can go ahead and take with them year after year. And uh, in a very similar way, I I loved my elementary school experience in (laughs) creating a code club and a robotics club club and allowing students to create and have discussions amongst themselves and do the problem solving definitely is a magical moment. Um, So when you describe that too as well, it just really took me back to those days working with the kids. And it's amazing what they can do when you put some tech in front of them. Even as a teacher, just giving them the little that you know they can take off and run with it. And that's really something that is exciting. And then now the work that you get to do with Adobe and going into classrooms and seeing what students need or how to enhance the learning experience, not only for the teacher and students, is something that is great and valuable. So along with that, my next question to you would be with the experience that you've had in teaching people how to code, coding in the classroom, doing maker spaces, and doing creative activities with students, um, what would be some of those skill or some of the skills that you see could, it, or maybe could be needed or that we can do better uh, now to prepare our students as they go from year to year and into the future of, of the work and in the future of learning? I, 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 I honestly think you hit the nail on the head over there. Um, the, you know, years ago, teaching was very formulaic, and um, fortunately, it's become less so. Uh, the what we teach kids in schools in K twelve and primary secondary now, uh, by the time they get out into the real world, stuff's going to change dramatically. And if it's if we're teaching them um, knowledge, things to know, check done, we're failing them. But if we're teaching them to to think creatively, to to not be scared by large problems, to understand um, how to collaborate, how to work with your peers, um, how to look at challenges as opportunities. That actually is real teaching. I mean, the uh, uh, I will make a confession, and I probably shouldn't do this on a podcast. It's going to be seen by lots and lots of people. But to this day, I don't know my time tables. I, I was they, they were drilled into me to memorize, 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 and I still get them wrong. But you know what? I've done pretty advanced mathematics because I could calculate the answer in my head. So all those aren't all those times spent needing it. Yes, for some kids that works, for others it doesn't. Um, the, the the teaching what needs to be taught, teaching the check, we're done, that kind of really bothers me. Um, what I, I'd much rather is we teach kids how to how to learn, how to be curious, how to not be intimidated by big problems, um, how to look at a challenge and go, heck yeah, I can do that, and then figure out how, and if you don't know how, figure out how, and then collaborate with somebody else. You know, the um, uh, I'm looking at all the um, the fuss right now about AI and ChatGPT and so on, and seeing the reactions from the schools that are saying, ban it. We have to seriously come on. We were kids. Banning it is that going to stop anybody doing anything? Like, you stick your head in the sand. That's not going to solve a problem. The reality is, that's going to be part of our kids' futures' lives. So let's figure out how we adapt and how we make it part of the classroom and teach how to use it responsibly. Um, it's an opportunity. It's not, it's not something to be scared of. Um, and if you don't figure it out, your kids will. Um, so th- that's what I want, you know, I, and, and that's actually part of what I do personally with my teaching and writing, but also what my team at Adobe does. You know, our job is to help teachers understand and help them feel very comfortable with empowering kids to do whatever it takes to be communicative, collaborative, and, and tackle creative problem solving and worry less about immediate outcomes and more about these much bigger issues that will make them very well-rounded, contributing members of society that can do magical things that we can't imagine because those problems don't exist yet. Yeah, no, I agree with you, you know, and one of the things, and I'll be honest with you, Ben, and even 16 years in education, uh, 
it, it really has changed in the way where it's more, like you said, more of the check mark. We did our curriculum, we covered this, check and check, but uh, teachers are delivering the content, and but that's really all they're doing. They're just delivering it. But I see that many times due to the stresses and additional pressures, obviously, state testing right now, you know, at least our district and several districts around the nation are getting, are either already in it or they're getting ready to start the state testing. And so all of that work is, you know, for these next, you know, couple of weeks where they test for a three hour, four hour test that really I always tell my students, this does not define who you are because, you know, it, it's, it's a three hour test based on everything that you did the whole year. And for many students, you know, they, they, they're not maybe great test takers. You don't know what they come, you know, to school with and so on for those uh, days where they do the testing. But I have always been a believer and maybe very similar to you that if we allow the students to take ownership of their own learning and have them create like you were talking about. I remember some of my lesson lessons that I would do is, okay, we're going to cover, I would just introduce the lesson. Here are the Chromebooks. The Chromebooks lived in my classroom. I had Makey Makey kids. I had, you know, a couple of iPads and so on. I said, okay, you know, we're going to work on a presentation and you can present it to me in whichever which way you feel most comfortable with. And of course, allowing the students that I had that were emergent bilinguals that maybe didn't want to go up and present, they created these screencastifies where they just recorded themselves, but they still were able to, uh, you know, adopt the proper academic vocabulary. They were able to build up their speech. They were able to uh, just feel more confident that by the end of the year, they wanted to present. I had other students that were just great at presentations and, you know, would go out there and just shine, but everybody was collaborating and I was still able to cover the curriculum. I was still able to assess. But the great part about it that I always tell everybody, I had digital learning artifacts that my students were submitting to me that at any given time I can show to a principal or if I had to go to a meeting or share some good stuff with parents and say, look at what your son or daughter is doing and they're doing some great things. And it, it's just magical, truly, like you, you explain it. So I have a question for you, maybe right now in the, not the kryptonite question yet, but right now in the current state of education, what might be some things that you see that may be some of those barriers to really just help teachers feel comfortable with injecting some creativity within the classroom? Um, I think you kind of answered it already. I would say there are two, two I'll give two answers. One is, um, I think teachers are not feeling as empowered as I'd like them to be. You know, we have this very dogmatic, top-down, one-size-fits-all approach. And the teachers are in the classrooms. They know the kids. They know what's best. I mean, and we're not giving them enough latitude to adapt and adjust for what's best for their kids. And so uh, there's a bit of a misfit there, and that's, that has to be addressed. And the, the more we try to standardize and the more we try to do top-down you know, mandates and high funding to specific outcomes, the more that's going to continue to happen. That's really concerning. Um, we're not trusting educators enough to do what they know is right, to tell them what they need to do. Um, the, the other, then there's, in addition to that, there is, um, at some level, there's a confidence issue as well, right? There's, um, at least for some teachers who've been at the game for a long time, uh, there's still a mindset that the teacher knows best and it's their job to like impart wisdom and fill the kids' brains with all this magical stuff. And the idea that you're doing things that you might yourself not know and be a little uncomfortable isn't, isn't uh, for some teachers, it's harder. It's, it's becoming less of an issue, but it's something we try very, very hard to address and let the teachers understand that, you know what, it's perfectly okay not to know and let the kids figure out for you. Uh, let me share, share an effort with you. Um, I spent a lot of time talking to um, to some of the leads of some of the districts, school districts all over the country. Um, I was talking about a year or so ago with uh, uh, the lead of a very large district. I'm not going to say which one because I don't have permission to use the quotes, but a very large district. And he was telling me that for the average kid, and he, and he mentioned a particular community that's uh, um, a very tough socioeconomic underserved community. And he said, if that, if it, he said, first of all, getting those kids to stay in school is hard enough as it is. But if by some miracle those kids stayed in school, and when they left, they knew they could write a paper and they, they could spell. And they knew all the times tables. They knew all that, all the check, check, check. But if they don't know how to take out the phone and shoot a video in their own voice and tell their story or present their own experiences in images and infographics, we have failed them and robbed them of the future. 
and he's 100% correct. It is, it is a, the word you said before, confidence. It is about creating a very confident generation who has a, I don't give a damn attitude, I can do it. I just can't do it, no matter my background, no matter my backstory, no matter where I grew up. And that's what I want. And if the spelling is incorrect, oh, well, get over it. You know, <laughs> um, I've written a whole lot of books and I make spelling mistakes and my editors catch them. Oh, well, guess what? You know, Google's really good at putting a red squiggly line. You'll figure it out. That's not going to make or break your life. But but not having the confidence to get out there and, and, and state your claim and tell your story and and and, and um, share with the world what is uniquely you, that's devastating. You know, I, I, I talk to a lot of um, uh, of uh, people, you know, poly, policymakers, people that... Um, um, you know, driving a lot of the decisions around around education policy. And one of the things I try to remind them regularly is um, we don't need lots more of the same, right? Corporate America and, and companies in general are not saying, huh, I want to hire you because you're exactly like thousands of other people who do the exact same thing. They want you because you're you and you're unique and different. And if we're trying to create, you know, clones, lemmings coming out of school, not empowering every child to find what is uniquely them, when we're doing them a disservice. Uh, and so um, I, I, it's a good question. I think you know the, the, the job of a teacher has changed, and teachers in my days were really, you know, whip you into shape, all do the same darn thing. That doesn't work anymore. Nor should it. I'm glad it's gone. Um, the teachers I meet nowadays are caring, compassionate, empathetic people who genuinely want to do what's right by the kids. No one becomes a teacher to get rich. You become a teacher because you care about kids, and it's our job to give them the tools and the latitude and the platform and the ability to do what they know is right. And the sooner everyone else gets out of the way and let them do the job, the better. Yes, I absolutely agree. And I love what you mentioned with the story with the school district. It is so important. You know, now it's when you get into universities, you get, I mean, you're using those tools, the collaboration skills, the video, you're, you're putting all of that out there. And for sometimes, actually for some students that may have never had that experience, it becomes rather difficult once they get into programs many times and and I'll be quite honest with you you know even through my master's program and even through right now my doctoral program there are still many you know uh, teachers educators there like my age and so on that are still having a little bit of trouble with you know creating multimedia presentations and so on so maybe it, you're absolutely right a little bit just on that confidence issue of just maybe not taking creative risks. And oftentimes, you know, creative risks, uh, I think a lot of teachers just feel a little bit of, I don't want to do this because what if I mess up? And maybe my principal walks in and does an observation and then the tech doesn't quite work at that time. And they so, just yeah, kind of have I, those fears. I, I, I'm going to interject because I had a teacher just recently tell me just that. What if I get it wrong? And I had two responses. One, if you get it wrong, that's a teachable moment. Kids need to know that even adults get things wrong and try again. So that mm -hmm. itself is teaching, right? If you publicly say, oops, made a mistake, let's try it again, you've just taught, right? So that's what teaching is all about, right? But beyond that, I've got another great suggestion. How about you have the kids get up and teach that class for you? Pick a child who you think will learn the tool and have them get up and say, let me, first of all, you'll be a hero. That, that car, kid's going to get a boost of confidence. There are ways around this one, but you know, we've, we got to get past the mindset of the teacher knows everything and is the sage, right? Come on, we're not, we're all fallible. Yeah. And, you know, and that's one thing that I learned at a later, once I got into elementary, that it was okay to not know everything. It was okay to be vulnerable. And it, it was okay when my lessons didn't turn out the right way because. At that time, I had some students that would interject and say, oh, Mr. Mendoza, hold on, don't give up. Look, let's try this. And the students would figure it out. And one thing that I love that I always shared with a lot of my colleagues is you can learn so much from the students if you allow them to. And like you said, one of the things that I loved is they would go home and say, hey, I taught my teacher today and I taught them how to do this. And I absolutely loved it because it built up their confidence. But not only that, because of what I learned during that first block, I would share that with second block. And then what I learned from second block, I would share it with my third. And then by the end of the day, I looked like the expert. But what I loved is that without the students knowing, everybody was collaborating and learning from each other, even though they weren't in the same class, because I was passing on that knowledge that I took from my first class to my second class and so on. And it just really, truly seemed like a wonderful collaborative effort. And 
it's something magical and uh, you know until you experience it and just take a chance you know you would be so amazed at what the students are able to do if we give them a little bit of time and just a little bit of guidance but let them just roll with it it's amazing yeah, absolutely. even in my, in my coding robotics classroom i don't consider myself a teacher um, my job is to be a facilitator and to um get out of the way, create opportunities then get out of the way you know, just provide some some guidelines and be there to provide support and when needed. But really, the job is to be um, to be encouraging and to let them figure things out. Excellent. Yeah, I definitely want to give a shout out here to a couple of people that have just uh, started joining us in the chat. We have Josh, Josh Tovar, who is an amazing principal, and uh, he definitely, you know, cares about kids. And he had some great comments here. It says kids don't know. Uh, kids do not care how much you know until they know how much you care. So things yeah. of that sort. And I definitely want to welcome Abid. Uh, Patel, who's joining us all the way from the UK. I know Abbott should probably be sleeping, but I just want to give the A to the B to the I to the D a big shout out for joining us this uh, uh, well this evening here. And he says that it's great to see you, Ben. He said that he had uh, the pleasure of meeting you at BET 2020. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 that's a great show. It's the largest education conference in, in Europe. And I, I was going there every year. I've not been there since COVID. And I Missed it a few days ago. It just was. So um, I will hopefully go back the next year and I'll be hopefully I'll see you then when I'm there next year. Perfect. Excellent. Yeah, you definitely need to take another selfie with Abbott because Abbott is the selfie king there in the <laughs> UK. Um, all right. So, Ben, let's talk a little bit here. You know, I, I want to know about your authorship, too, as well. You have 40 books written and I'm pretty sure that there'll probably be more on the way. But uh, when was it exactly that you kind of caught that that writing bug? And, uh, you know, just tell us a little bit about that. Obviously, I think it's probably because of the passion of you teaching. But then exactly. now all of a sudden it's like, hey, let's put these books together. And how did that lead to 40 books? <laughs> um, writing is for me is teaching at scale. It's just it's a way to get beyond 20, 30 kids into a classroom to get to hundreds of thousands of people all over the world. Um, I've always loved the written word. I mean, I love reading. You can see behind me, I'm, I'm a bit of a book fanatic and I love I love reading. I love writing. They've always been a part of my life. And so I've always liked the written word. Um, writing is something that was kind of on my to-do list. Like one day I want to author a book and it was purely opportunistic. Um, this is a very early internet days and in, you know, mid nineties back when everyone was trying to go, you know, create an idea and go public in the dot-com dot com era. Um, and because I love teaching and love sharing, I spent a lot of time on online forums, um, answering people's questions um, around coding and so on while I was building my own business at the time. Um, and um, I was contacted by a publisher who said, we're looking for someone to write a book to teach people how to you know, do internet development. We've seen all the questions you're answering. Would you be interested? And I thought, yeah, why not? So I wrote my first book, loved it, then wrote a sequel and wrote a sequel. And I've been writing ever since. And I, you know, I, I, I write one or two books a year. Um, and I, I, I do them simply because I, it's, um, it, again, it's, it, I, I actually write the way I teach. You know, when I'm writing, um, I kind of picture the readers in front of me, whether it's adult readers or child readers, and try to envision, okay, where would they get stuck? What do they need next? And so when I'm writing, you know, on the page, there's a, a note or a tip. It's kind of what I would imagine saying, hello, I've got a question of what that might be and try to anticipate it. So it's a very informal writing style that is very much teaching. Um, and that's why I do it. It's just another way to teach. And you know, I've been very, very fortunate um, over the last, I've been writing for 25 years now. I've taught coding for over a million people. I have books in 16 languages. And to this day, I mean, I get emails from readers several times a week from all over the world. Um, and I do answer every email, every question I get. It takes a while, but I do. Um, and um, I, I just love it. It's just, honestly, it's another way to teach and and um, and reach as many people as possible and give them the skills that are that I believe they need. That is wonderful. And I love what you said there. You know, I, I, I know reading can definitely help, but I just love the phrase that you said, you know, it's like teaching at scale. You know, sometimes I never thought about that, but you're absolutely right. I mean, you're getting the word out to so many other people aside from, you know, just the people that you would have in a regular classroom setting or at a conference and so on. I mean, you're reaching right. millions of people and that is absolutely amazing. I don't know. That just really kind of hit me there. I had never thought about it that way. Yeah, and the, most, the most one I had um, rising actually was the most recent book. I did a book about a year ago and it was, uh, the, I wrote a book that I co-authored with one of my sons and that was a fun experience. So he's a, he's a you know, brilliant young man, much smarter than me. Uh, he's an engineer and he loves teaching as well. So he, he, he's an engineer, but he teaches on the side. He teaches coding too. Back then was teaching coding as a volunteer on the side to middle middle schoolers. And this was in COVID, where both of us suddenly 
found we couldn't teach anymore because we used to be in a lab with computers. Now, how do you teach remotely? And we had to pivot our teaching to online. And so we took our year's worth of teaching coding online and combined it and created a book that we released about a year ago. And it's the first book that we wrote, uh, that I wrote specifically to be a, uh, with teachers of mind, it's designed to be a middle and high school textbook um, to teach creative thinking and creative problem solving using Python coding and games as a way to get there. And that was a fun project. You know, I, I generally don't like working with co-authors. I, I, I'm a bit of a control freak with my writing. But writing a book with my son was actually a whole lot of fun. I enjoyed that. I would definitely do that again. Oh, that is wonderful. So, I mean, so tell me a little bit about that experience, so too, as well. I mean, to me, I mean, just the fact that you're you're writing a book with, um, you know, your son, I mean, that's definitely got to be a very unique experience all in itself. And so, and like you said right now, you know, you're a little bit of a control freak. So how how smooth was uh, the, the writing process as your, both your minds kind of joined together to put this book together? Um, it, it was actually very smooth because we had a good division of labor. Um, you know, I've had co-authors in books before, and then they feel disjointed. You know, I write a chapter, you write a chapter, the next person writes a chapter, and it doesn't flow. Um, I did most of the writing, he did most of the examples and coding, and I pulled them in, and then we edited and collaborated together. So it was very much a collaboration, but there was a good division of labor. Uh, it was a first publishing experience for him. Uh, he was thrilled when his, the book came out with his name on the cover, and then the book came out translated in Chinese Mandarin, and he was thrilled yet again. So it, it was a wonderful experience, and it was uh, it was good to get his take as well on on classrooms because he's you know a lot younger than me, and um, and and so a teacher at a different age, and it was, it was good to com, you know com, compare and combine our experiences. Oh, wonderful, that's great. That's such a great experience, and just having an amazing project like that, and just putting it out there together. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, Ben, I wanted to ask you now too as well. I know we you talked a little bit about it as you get to visit classrooms, being Adobe Senior Director of Education Initiatives. I would love to know the story, how you know you got to that role or that position, you know, just, you know, sure. how did that happen? <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, you know, I've, look, Adobe's a wonderful company and I've been here a long time. I've been at Adobe almost 25 years, which is astonishing when I say it. Um, I generally don't last anywhere too long, uh, but I've been having a lot of fun. Um, and I've had a variety of roles when I was here. You know, I first joined as a, as a product evangelist for some of our internet products because of my background there. And then, you know, ended up building a developer relations team and then a help and learn team and so on. But as I look back at the time I spent at Adobe, the roles have always been somewhere. You know, if you have a Venn diagram of of technology and 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 uh, teaching and creativity, and somewhere in the middle is my happy place. And so all the roles at Adobe have kind of evolved out of that. But um, I was for a long time really wanted a K twelve focus, and Adobe has obviously had a very strong presence in education for a long time. But it was kind of a broad education. Here's tools for education; you should use them. We weren't really taking a step back and trying to understand what do educators need and what do teachers need and so on. And so a small group of us um, uh, got together, this is going on probably close to 10 years now, and made a case for Adobe really making a focused effort around teachers and what educators need. And I was one of the team that helped, helped push that along. I'm not taking any credit for it. It wasn't me, but I was part of a group that did that. Um, and so, um, uh, and it, it proved effective. And one of the things that we learned early on, and this is kind of, Duh, in retrospect, but we learned early on is that you can have the best products out there and you can have the best curriculum, but um, education, particularly K-12 education, is a relationship game. Teachers want to hear from fellow teachers. They don't want to hear from corporate mouthpieces. They don't want to hear corporate marketing. They want to trust what fellow educators are doing. And so it really became important to um, start talking to other educators and get their input on the products and help them tell the story as well. And um, I know you know many of the people on my team, many of the educators, you know, rock star educators themselves, um, you know, we're the ones who are responsible for helping teachers understand the role creativity plays in the classroom um, and making the tools as available and accessible to them, make sure they have the right tooling they need, make sure they have the right training. Um, I see uh, Tanya mentioned the ACE team, the Adobe Creative Educators. That's part of the, part of the communities that my team runs as well. Um, and we love our ACEs. We love our, our, our creative educators. Um, yeah, our job is to make sure that uh, as educators are as um, confidently equipped as possible to tell a broad creativity story. So I worry a little less about the mechanics of using a specific tool. You know, whether you want to use Photoshop or whether you want to use Premiere or use uh, Adobe Express. Um, there are lots of great tools out there that help you learn the exact menu options. I, I worry less about that. What I worry more about is, you know, for a fourth grade science teacher saying, so what does video mean to me? Or a sixth grade English language arts teacher saying, what does infographics and pictures need to me, right? If I'm teaching 
you know, a videography class in high school, they need it, but what do everybody else need it? That's what I worry about. And so what is the, what is the way we make these tools very meaningful and pedagogically relevant? And, and explain, help our teachers on it. And once they understand it, they get it, right? This is the tools, particularly Adobe Express, anybody can learn it. Um, it's the why. What's it, what does it mean for you? What does it mean for your students? And that's what we worry about. You know, we, we um, our, our team spends all our time really doing two things. One being the voice of Adobe to the educators, but equally being the voice of educators back to Adobe to make sure Adobe understands what does the average middle school teacher need and make sure we're doing right by them. You know, the right content, right features, right curriculum, right programs as well. And um, honestly, it's awesome. A, I'm, I work with some of the smartest educators around, some of them actually on my team, but also educators around the world. Um, several of the people in the comments are mentioning the ACEs. The ACEs are phenomenal. We love them. So I'm working with some of the smartest, most passionate, brilliant educators anywhere, um, and getting to help build products that make them uh, successful and uh, help their students enjoy creating, and in doing so, start to develop those fundamental creativity, communication, and collaborative skills that are going to serve them through life. Oh, yes, absolutely. I agree with everything that you said there, you know, as far as, um, you know, the Adobe tools and Adobe Express just readily available for any teachers. And I love that our district has that available for everybody and the students. And but I love what you mentioned, you know, that, yes, the, the tools are there, you know, it, it they very are. A, they very well are a low barrier to entry. It's really fairly simple to use. But I love that you said the, the why as far as why is this infographic, the creativity component, the video and so on and how you can add that. And like I always say, sprinkle it onto what you are already doing great in the classroom and take it to that next level. Takes me back a little bit to what you said that when you were a student, you didn't quite get that learning experience and now students can definitely get that learning experience, but also themselves create their own learning experiences and they understand the why. They, they're they creating, um, you know, just a, they're a project, they're creating, you know, whatever it is that the teacher needs them to create, but it, it's a little bit of them going into it. But I also love the fact, like you said, you know, as an educator too, I get to know my students a little bit more by what they submit what they feel more comfortable with. And I can still gauge the learning. I can still gauge to see that the student did master a skill, but also I can give amazing feedback through their projects because then I can say, oh, there's a little misconception here. As a teacher, I can go ahead and fix that immediately rather than do a whole class reteach. I can kind of see, hey, you know, maybe I have four kiddos that are giving me the same answer that's a little bit slightly off, but I can fix it right then and there. But just, again, I get to see a little bit of their personalities shine through in the way that they present the material back. But yeah, yeah. The, the but creativity, creativity is a natural phenomenon. I mean, we're born creative. Um, you know, kids from a very young age want to draw and take their crayons and probably color on the wall. I mean, they want to tell stories. They, I think all humans are born creative. But over, over, over time, they're kind of taught to stop being creative and start being right. And we got to fix that. This is a, you know, so Ken Robinson is no longer with us, talked about this regularly, and I was a fan of a lot of what he said. Um, the, uh, this is actually, um, this is natural for students. It's a natural form of expression to be able to share their ideas in a way that's uniquely theirs. And I just, you know, what we're trying to do is help educators figure out how to do that in a way that still lets them do what they need to do. Because at the end of the day, they're going to ask, did you teach A, B, and C, and check, 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 did you assess? And, and that's a challenge, right? There, there, are, there are conflicting interests over there. Um, we want to make sure, um, yeah, I was um, I was interviewed a while ago, shortly after COVID, there was a, um, there was a, I think it was in Fortune or Forbes, it was one of the financial magazines had this cover story about how all the time lost in COVID, how, we, how, how are schools going to catch up the lost time? And they were talking about the nightmare scenario of not catching up. And... I kind of cringed and I said, my nightmare scenario is catching up because what I don't want is to try cram two years of content into a year now, three years of content into a year. So what are we going to cut? We're going to cut arts. We're going to cut athletics. We're going to cut after hours. We're going to cut, like what are we going to cut? You know, it, it, I'm okay. The kids missing some content that they, they should have had as long as they are happy, joyful at being in class, wanting to be there, confident, curious, wanting to learn. You can make up for any lost time. And if we're just trying to ram content into their throats and it is enjoyable, 
they're not going to get anything out anyway. This is this is about joy. I I am happiest when I walk into a classroom and I see kids who are thrilled and want to be there, and a teacher who wants to share the information to them. Everything else is easy. Once you've done that, I don't care if it's math or science. We'll figure that out. But if the kids don't want to be in school, we've got much, much bigger problems. To me, the biggest issue is, can we put joy back in the classrooms? And the way I see us doing that is by letting kids be themselves, find their voices, and do something that is uniquely theirs, as opposed to doing what somebody else expects. Yes, absolutely. I agree with you 100%. And one thing that I noticed, and I, I was... Is, Tisha Poncio was on a podcast many, many, you know, podcast episodes ago. And uh, it was interesting that she did share because at that time she was teaching uh, ninth grade or and 10th grade. And, you know, she was talking about students uh, or talking to students about creativity. And they all pretty much kind of had the the answer of from about third grade on third grade to about ninth grade. There was a very, you know, a lot of decline in that creative component. But because we know that those grade levels are state testing grade levels, and you don't get a lot of opportunities to really, again, because we have to check the boxes to really take those creative risks and give the students that creative freedom to show their learning. So I agree with you. I mean, the classroom yeah, I mean, should I, I, be. Honestly, that, that's part of why we built Adobe Express. You know, mm -hmm. I, I love tools like Photoshop and Illustrator and Premiere and After Effects. Those are big, powerful tools, and I want kids to be exposed to them because if they want careers in those fields, I want them to use the tools that industry is using. But I also want a tool that gets out of the way. We're recognizing that you've got a 40 minute class and we're doing a, a, a module on the water cycle or tadpoles turning, whatever it is. Um, if the teacher spends 35 of those 40 minutes teaching how to use a tool, that's going to be a problem. But if the tool gets out of the way and there are templates in there already and they can just click and they're, they're doing the same work. They're creating their paper. But now instead of it being a boring with four words, it's got the right colors and they, find, they, they do a search and find the images. It's the exact same work. So the teacher can go, check, yep, I taught this module properly. But the kids actually had fun at the same time. That, that combination is ideal. And we built Adobe Express to solve exactly that problem. That We built it so the tool gets out of the way and the kids can focus on learning and have fun and creativity along the way. Love it. Love it. And that's great. I love that. And you're absolutely right. The tool does get out of the way fairly easy and the templates that you have there. And even just when, when Tanya and I had the opportunity to do the summit here and just to share with our teachers, I mean, they were blown away just by how easy it was to take some projects, remix them, and you don't have to start from zero, but you still get to personalize it, have some fun with it. And it was just a great experience seeing some teachers that were just blown away and being creative themselves. I told them many times we, we need to start learning to be cre creative ourselves too. So that way we can share that creativity with our students as well. So it was all a great experience, but Ben, thank you so much. I really appreciate this great conversation. Uh, let me see what Tanya says here. It says you need crazy teachers like us to mix in all the tools for our students to use and create while having fun. Absolutely, Tanya. Thank you so much for joining us. And Ben, it's been a great conversation. Thank you so much for your passion. Thank you so much for your inspiration and all the work that you continue to do. But before we wrap up, uh, this is my favorite segment of the show where I always like to end with the last three questions here for our guests. And of course, we've got Josh. Josh already knows the routine. He's like, the three questions, bro. <laughs> so, and this is Josh's favorite question, which is, the kryptonite so ben in the current state of education what would you say is your current edu kryptonite uh that's an easy one unfortunately um and it's one we kind of touched on already um i get really upset even irate when i see teachers not being respected and given the tools they need to succeed and I'm not just talking about funding. Teachers, by the way, should be overpaid. I, I'm waiting for the day when people are lining up to get a job in teaching because it's the best paid jobs out there. So beyond that, um, I'm talking about um, trust their instincts and let them do what's right in the classroom. Um, I'm talking about um, making sure they have all the tools they need so they're not having to do it themselves on the side. I'm talking about simplify assessment and tracking so that they can actually focus on their jobs. I'm talking about putting them in the uncomfortable position of being caught between parents and school boards. Like, get out of the way. Let teachers do what they came to do and stop undermining and disrespecting teachers. I just can't stand that. All right. Oh, okay. you, you, kind of, you kind of ticked me off there. <laughs> no, great answer, though. Thank you so much for sharing that. Next question, Ben, is if you could have a billboard with anything on it, what would it be and why? Um, 
I might get in trouble from Nike on this one, but it will say, just do it. Um, that's always my take. If you have an idea, just give it a try. And I, this is my kids know this, my, my, my own children, my kids in school know this. If they want to try a project and it sounds wacky, I don't know, try it once. If it doesn't work, we won't try it again. Uh, my team at Adobe knows this. They come to me with an idea, a way to reach teachers. And I rarely say no. I will always say, yep. And if it doesn't work, let's get the learnings and try something different next time. So I'm, uh, I don't have a lot of regrets. I don't tend to look back. If I want to try something, my, my take always is nothing to lose. Try it. If it doesn't work, oh, well. So for me, big, that's an easy one. Just do it. Whatever the heck it is, do it. Perfect. Thank you so much. And really, it is inspirational. Honestly, sometimes you just have to just take that step. And, you know, like you said, just improvise, adapt and overcome depending on the situation. But don't ever regret not doing it and thinking like, oh, man, if I would have done it, just like you said, I think that's some great advice. All right. Last, last question, Ben. I know you wear many hats, but let's just add podcaster to your hat. So let's say that this was the Ben Forda uh, podcast and I had the honor of being your guest this evening. What might be one question you'd like to ask me? Um, I would ask you, what have you done today to improve students' outcomes and educators' jobs getting there? And I ask myself that all the time. And I ask my team that all the time. Um, it's very easy to get caught up in the details and nuances of our jobs, whether it's a podcast or a teacher with, with grading or a software company building software. At the end of the day, um, what are we doing for students? You know, I tell, this is going to sound a little pithy, uh, and I apologize for that, but I, my team knows this. I tell them this all the time. I tell them I don't work for Adobe. I say I'm employed by Adobe, and I'm greatly appreciative of that, but I work for teachers and I work for students. And that, so when I have to make a decision, the, 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 the answer always is, is this right for the average kid in an average school somewhere who needs all the help they can get? And so I ask that of everybody, and I would ask the same of you. Um, you're doing it with your podcast, but my question would be, if, if, you, if you consider yourself an educator and you're in the ed tech space, what have you done today to better a student's outcome and to help teachers make that happen? All right. Well, great question, because as the year winds down, this is the time where we already start working on the professional development. And one of the things that I do every year during the summer is we always make sure that we get that ACE training for our teachers, because, again, believing that allowing uh, the, our teachers to be exposed to some a wonderful tool like Adobe Express and see how they can tie it in to their pedagogy in a very low barrier to entry uh, way, then I want them to lose that fear so that way they can share it with our students and then our students are able to create and see that they can still show their personality, they can still learn and they can still take that learning experience from year to year with them. And to me, that's really the most important thing, you know, that a student is able to kind of own that experience in such a way that it becomes part of him. And also for the teacher, that they take it from year to year and then they just layer every year and just make it that much better. So it's really injecting that passion through some very intentional professional development that is great, not just your normal sit and get, but a professional development where it's like you're going to sit and create and have fun and have some joy and add that into not only yeah. your teaching space, but into the classroom space. So I, I appreciate that is that. what we're working on. <laughs> yeah, I really appreciate you saying that. The team worked really, really hard to build that ACE training you're talking about. So for those who are watching, ACE is the Adobe Creative Educator Program. You can find it online. It is totally free. Uh, it's a multi-level program. And as you get additional matching, you get additional benefits. And there are tens of thousands of educators in ACE. Um, and all we ask of ACES is that they commit to inject creativity in the classroom. We give them the tools and the wherewithal to get there, uh, totally free. So uh, yes, um, you can sign up for ACE. We can you can do it online. We can bring it to you. Um, do it. And uh, um, you know, for those who haven't tried Adobe Express yet, I really would encourage you to do so. It is Adobe Express is a paid product. It's a commercial product actually, but we give the full thing away for free to every K twelve student everywhere on the planet. And if your school district isn't using it yet, let us know. We'll get you hooked up uh, because you guys should be creating. Absolutely. Well, Ben, thank you so much for your passion again, your inspiration. And again, the honor of having you here on the podcast. It really means a lot. Thank you so much for finding some time to share your wonderful story, your journey, 
And, you know, I want to thank all our guests that were here with us. We had Josh, we had Tanya, we had Abid, who was joining us also as well. And for all our audience members that are going to catch this on the replay or re-listen to it, uh, thank you so much, as always, for making my EdTech life what it is today. We do what we do for you so we can bring some amazing stories that can inspire everybody and anybody in the education space. So please make sure that you stop by our website at myedtech.com life where you can check out this amazing episode and the other 195 amazing episodes with wonderful creators and educators that you can take a little bit of knowledge nuggets from and sprinkle them on to what you are already doing great. Please make sure also, if you want to contribute to our mission of connecting educators and creators, please stop by our merch store. You can get ready for your summer conference season. We've got some caps, some shirts, or get ready for a winter conference season and start planning ahead because we've got some great sweaters too as well. And as you know, all of that goes back into our mission. Please make sure you give us a like, share, and a follow. Make sure you follow us on all social media. That way all the algorithms will start putting us into your feed. But thank you so much, as always, from the bottom of my heart. And until next time, my friends, don't forget, stay techie.